you are owed all our love, all that we are. That is what you're owed. For that is why you created us, to be filled in your love. Well, I guess I just preempted my sermon, but um, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Peter, for those beautiful time of worship and prayer. So how many of you have ever played whack-a-mole? Uh, when my boys were small, we would take them to Chuck E. Cheese, and this little fake rubber mole would pop up out of these holes, and you had a big mallet, and your mission was to get your Thor on to release the Incredible Hulk within you and just smash that thing. And it'd sit there laughing at you, taunting you. But this game was created, right? It was created as a vessel of wrath, playful wrath. I think I liked it just as much as the boys did. It released something primal in me. It was so satisfying to be quick enough to catch that little beastie and give it a good whack. And speaking of whack-a-mole, um, I don't know how, how much, I don't listen to talk radio much, or Christian radio, or any radio for that matter. Uh, there are just too many quality podcasts by really good thinkers having excellent conversations. But apparently a large amount of what's coming over the airwaves on Christian radios uh, is stirring up fear, playing on our fear that we're on the brink of World War III, preaching the end times, and uh, using and misusing the book of Revelation to scare the Jesus out of people and then replace Jesus with another Jesus, one who looks very different than Jesus of the Gospels. A whack-a-mole like Jesus. But fear not, I'm not going to I'm not going to be playing whack-a-mole with every out-of-context proof text that's preaching a warped image of Jesus other than the Father. There's just too many, and that would be far too exhausting. I just don't much find, find much value in or satisfaction in arguing. Instead, I'm going to help you turn your attention onto the real Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, and give you the freedom to forgive and have compassion on the fear mongers instead of arguing with them, whether that's in person, over the family table at holiday time, or just in your head. Don't play whack-a-mole in your head, with your head. <laughs> or anyone else's. You don't need to fix them. God will save them too even if they are disappointed that his holy justice turns out to be restorative rather than retributive, that what God is owed is an open heart ready to be filled with love rather than a head to be whack a mold As the love and mercy of the Father and the Son takes root and transforms the hearts in the age to come, the desire to see God eternally whack them all the wicked will be pruned from their hearts. Love conquers all. From mole in the hole to the whammer with the hammer, love conquers all. The love of God transforms all. My goal for your heart for this sermon is to help you remain in a spirit of love, patience, peace, gentleness, even when others are trying to control and manipulate you through fear, specifically by manipulating your flesh, your false self, and its programs to fulfill your soul's need for esteem and affection, power and control, security and survival. This is the human condition, and Jesus is going to redeem it. Right now, I want to help you to ground your heart in the unconditional love and goodness of God. As the, source, as the source of all that is good, 
true, virtuous, and beautiful. God commands these things. He speaks these things into us because that is who God is. My goal for your mind, that is the biblical concept of mind, of your thoughts and emotions, is for this sermon to help equip you to abide in peace that surpasses understanding. Even as you wrestle through giving an answer for the hope that lies within you, even if you have more questions than answers. And each answer just leads to more questions. That is the way of wisdom. I pity the fool who thinks he must have all the answers so that he can lean on his own understanding rather than abide in the simplicity and union with Christ and let his knowledge and his wisdom unfold in his time. My goal for your faith for this sermon is to help to equip you to abide in the faithfulness of Christ in you, letting your faith in Christ flow out of utter response to the faith of Christ within you. Faith, Faith is the response of the Spirit of God dancing within the innermost part of your soul as Christ The living word of God reveals the lavish love of the Father. I'll repeat that one again. Faith is the response of the Spirit of God dancing, rejoicing, singing within the innermost part of your soul as Christ, the living word of God, reveals the lavish love of the Father. It might take a long time for our understanding, our left brain, simplified models of how things work to catch up with what we're already abiding in our spirit. But that's okay. God is patient and he will complete that which he has begun. My goal for your body for this sermon is one of integration. The body keeps the score. What our minds and hearts wrestle with are expressed in the body. So right now, I just invite you, if you're able, if you're willing, to breathe through your nose and take a deep breath down into your belly. This sends a signal to the body, to the parasympathetic nervous system, that you're in a safe place. We're in a receptive place. When we're breathing up high in the chest, shallowly, it puts our body in a sympathetic response of fight or flight. I'm not here to fight with you not physically or mentally. I'm not here to manipulate you through fear and pride. I don't want to stir up anything but the spirit within you. I'm here to help you abide in the love and shalom of God flowing in us, with us, through us, among us. So let's do that right now. Close your eyes. If you're able to breathe through your nose, breathe through your nose, just down deep into your belly. And then gently, gently, silently, call on the name of the Lord by whatever name you prefer to call on him. Jesus, Father, Abba, Spirit. Jesus. 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 
His love, His presence is real. It's only in our imagination, caught up in our heads, and in our stress that makes God appear absent, that blinds the heart and mind to His real presence. When we gently call on the name of Jesus that way, we are not trying to get God's attention. Think we will be heard if we say his name enough time. We are gently inviting our soul to be attentive to the divine presence walking in the garden of our souls, calling us by name, even as the spirit within us responds by calling him. My goal for your soul this morning, your soul, that union of heart, mind, soul, and body, may be filled with the faith of Christ and and that your soul will truly be one within you. Not my mind's over here, my heart's over there, my body's over there, my attention's back there, but one with Christ at the center, Christ holding it all together. That you would experience not only union within yourself, but also Christ's union with you. And in Christ, you would experience being united to all things. And in full union, in, with, and through Christ, experiencing the infilling of the divine nature that God might be all in all. So we're going to look at three questions this morning. What is the real character of Jesus when he returns? What is the real heart of the Father towards believers and non-believers, the righteous and unrighteous? And the third question, what is God's plan, God's mission for creation? Is God on the move? What is God doing? In other words, what is God's mission? What is the mission of God throughout history? So the first question, what is the real character of Christ when he returns? I've heard it said that the first time he came as a lamb, but the second time, He's coming back with a lion, a roaring lion. Well, I will defer you to Jesus as presented in the Gospels by the apostles, those who lived with him, walked with him, ministered with him, slept with him, ate with him, traveled everywhere by foot with him, long conversations day after day after day, seeing how Jesus conducted himself among real people, They knew his character. And then they compared the Jesus they knew, whom they knew in the flesh, with the Jesus they knew in the spirit after the resurrection. And it was the same Jesus. They walked with him in the spirit. They ministered with him. And they died with him. Most of them martyred, tortured. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whether he's present in the flesh or present in the spirit, his character has not changed. If someone is mishandling the apocalyptic genre of the book of Revelation or apocalyptic genre when it appears in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and is reading into them a different image of Jesus that is different than Jesus of the gospel, then they're preaching another Jesus. The gospel is not just background material to prove that Jesus was a worthy, worthy to be the Lamb of God. The background is the gospel. Excuse me, the gospels are the good news, the revelation of Jesus, who is the revelation of the Father, through whom 
God is bringing about his kingdom. They may be preaching from the Bible, but like the Pharisees, they are searching the scriptures, but missing the testimony of the scriptures pointing to Jesus. They have replaced the revelation of Christ for the revelation of the return of the retributive God. Loving his people, but without compassion or mercy to his enemies. A God who wants his pound of flesh. His pound of flesh on Jesus for us, and his pound of flesh in eternal conscious torment toward those who won't let Jesus be their pound of flesh. But that is not what is in the heart of God. That is not what God is owed, but that is what God becomes when you're reading Scripture through the lens of retributive justice. So when you come to hard passages, let Jesus invite you to take a walk with him down the road of Emmaus and abiding in his peace and love. Let the resurrected Lord reveal how the scriptures are revealing him and let those answers unfold in their time. So what is the real heart of the Father towards believers and non-believers, the righteous and unrighteous? Well, God is love in whom there is no darkness at all. God is salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God willing, God's willingness and power to save is not limited by physical death. There is nowhere, not in among the dead, not in Sheol, where you can hide from his spirit. God has consigned all to disobedience so that God may have mercy on all. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, joyfully confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I truly believe that most preachers who are using fear of a wrathful God to scare people into repentance, they mean well. But in using fear, they are preaching to our false self, the flesh, reinforcing the lies from the snake, who is speaking lies in the garden of their souls. God is not truly good. Behind that Jesus mask, the Father will throw most people into hell, and he'll enjoy their torture, their suffering. That's the God you must serve. If you get the heart of God wrong, that in his heart, to satisfy the holiness of God, he needs to, he's owed retributive justice that results in eternal conscious torment, then you will do severe damage to your image of God. Peace will no longer mean peace. Reconciliation will no longer mean reconciliation. Love will not mean love. Justice will not mean justice. Good will no longer mean good. Forgiveness does not mean forgiveness. Yeshua no longer means God is salvation. You will end up with a merciless, compassionless, transactional view of justice. But on a positive note, you can believe all those things and Christ will still save you. On a negative note, on that day you will weep bitterly for the people you caused to reject your grotesque, warped image of Jesus and the Father. But even still, in his compassion and mercy, Christ will dry your tears and heal you and show you true love, reconciliation, justice, goodness. Just how high and wide and deep the salvation of God reaches, saves and transforms. So is God on the move and what is God doing? In other words, what is the mission of God? Well, in order to keep this simple, and not spring it on you at the end, and and I'm just going to come right out and say it. (laughs) 
The mission of God, God who is over all, through all, and in all, is to unite all things in Christ so that he might fill all things. The mission of God, the grand narrative of Scripture, the grand narrative of creation, who, God who is over all, through all, and in all, is to unite all things in Christ so that he might fill all things. If you ground yourself in the character of Jesus of the Gospels, not a Jesus that you rework to fit some theory of atonement, but the real character of Jesus as portrayed in the Gospels, then you will be grounded in the true character of God, the true character of the Father. You won't be baited by fear or intimidation to play whack-a-mole with every out-of-context proof text powered by an out-of-character Jesus in an unchrist-like image of the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. There's not, a, there's not a good God, bad God thing going on here. God is good all the way through. So, returning to our questions, what is the real character of Jesus when he returns? Well, it's like most good Sunday school answers. The answer is Jesus. The same Jesus as in the gospel, yesterday, today, and forever. What is the real heart of the fathers toward believers and non-believers, the righteous and unrighteous? It's Jesus. The same Jesus as in the gospels, yesterday, today, and forever. What is God's plan, God's mission from the beginning of creation to the end of time? Well, Jesus. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. The mission of God, who is over all, through all, and in all, is to unite all things in Christ so that he might fill all things. That's what God is owed. Open vessels to be filled. Creation waiting to be filled, ready to be filled. Well, the first, two, the first two seem fairly obvious. However, if we get the mission of God wrong, then we start warping the character of Jesus and warping the character of the Father to fit the mold of our story. And then we lose. We lose the real character of Jesus. We lose the real heart of the Father. So let's turn to Ephesians 4, 1 to 10, and see what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has to say about the big story, the mission of God. Therefore I, Ephesians 4.1, we'll, we'll read it, we'll read the whole passage through. Therefore I, the prison of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Ephesians 4, 1 to 10. So let's turn to the first three verses. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Therefore, I, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Humility, patience, gentleness, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity in the bond of peace. Those, those characteristics kind of sound familiar. 
I, I think there was someone in the Bible who exhibited that. Who was that? I know it starts with a J. Uh, it wasn't Judas. Uh, it wasn't James or John, the sons of, sons of thunder who wanted to call down fire on a town that rejected Jesus. Oh, Jesus, yeah, of course. Well, if Jesus is like that, then is it safe to assume that to have seen Jesus, who says to have seen me is to have seen the Father, that the Father is like that too? Is that a fair assumption? And if Jesus is like that, humility, gentleness, patience, then is it safe to imagine that the Father is not like that? Is it safe to imagine that Jesus, after sitting down at the right hand of God, the Father, and being given all authority and power, comes back of lesser character, of a different character? That he comes back, that he comes back proud, harsh, out of patience, diligent to break the unity of the Spirit with the weapons of war. Is Jesus going to come back to get his smash on, his whack-a-mole? Well, of course it's not safe. Not because God will punish you, but because you have grieved the Holy Spirit who is revealing Christ, who is revealing the Father, and you've been taken captive by a false god, clinging to that false god, that false Christ might just drag you captive into hell. But fear not. God will never abandon you. That is not God's final judgment. Jesus is God's final judgment. And he's already gone there before you. There is one body and one spirit Verses, we begin four to six, Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I wasn't making that up. That's, that's in the scripture. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One body, the body of Christ. Christ, the second Adam, the head of all humanity in whom all are members. Just as in the first Adam all died, so in Christ, the second Adam, all shall be made alive. The second Adam has become a life-giving spirit. There is one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father through the Son. The one hope of your calling, Christ in you, the hope of glory, for which all creation waits with bated breath to be revealed. Romans 8. One faith, the faith and faithfulness of Christ, Christ in whom all the fullness of the deity dwells, has made his home in you, and his love and his faithfulness is beating in you. One baptism, the baptism of water, fire, and the Spirit, they are one continual flow of the spirit of repentance, forgiveness, sanctification, and transformation into the image of Christ. And not only transformed into his image, but made one with him. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all. The Father, as Jesus said, my Father and your Father, my God and your God. God is love. The love of the Father of all, over all, through all, and in all. Does all mean all or only believers, only the righteous? All people, all things? Well, let's continue reading. We'll hold on to that. So it'll, it'll, it'll come. Ephesians 4, 7 to 8. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives, and he gave gifts to people. Well, that caught my attention as we sat with that a few weeks ago in sacred space. He led captive the captives. Well, 
that's really good news for the captives. Just how deep into the depths of Sheol will Christ go to rescue the captives? What if he led them captive, though? What about their free will? What if, what if the captives are so broken in spirit, so accustomed to abuse by the powerful, the spiritual wickedness in high places, powerful people, powerful processes and elements within our society, that their wills are too captive to trust that Christ is good and they refuse to be rescued? What if they've been preached a warped image of Jesus, a warped image of the Father, and don't trust Jesus? Instead, they choose to, to flee deeper into the outer darkness. Ah, Jesus is coming back and he's going to drag me before the Father and torture me forever for my sins. Hide, run, escape. But apparently, he leads captive the captives. His will overrides their will. They're broken, corrupt, dead, ineffectual will. God's will to complete his mission trumps our will to remain in captivity to sin and death. Like a child being rescued from human traffickers, we have lost the ability to hope that the one offering to rescue us is truly good. The good shepherd gathers us, gathers us up our broken wills, our broken souls. He overpowers our attempts to fight him off and carries us out of hell and into life in his kingdom. He heals their wills, our wills. We're safe at last, free at last. We can begin to be open to love and the infilling of God. And he gave gifts to people. Well, like what? Well, existence, life, the incarnation of the Son of God, salvation from deaths, from sin, death, and the evil, salvation into the life of Christ, sharing in Jesus' union with the Father, the eternal life of knowing the Son and the Father, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection from the dead, every spiritual blessing in Christ, Gifts to bless others as the presence and action of God moves in us, with us, through us. The gift of drawing us into his love, joy, peace, worship, handiwork, beauty, wisdom, silence. The gift of mercy, love and joy for us, taking root in us, being shared with one another. In other words, the gift of who he is, his name. And when we pray in his name, we are praying in the fullness of all that he is. Now this expression, verse 9, now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. I'd like us to recite the Apostles' Creed together. If you, if you would recite this with me. Make sure I have the same version. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So Jesus, who was with the Father before all creation, descends to earth to be born into humanity. And from there, he suffers. He is crucified. He dies, is buried, 
And he descends even further into the realm of the dead, into Sheol, the grave, the intermediate state between death, resurrection, and final judgment. The eternally begotten Son of God, the very one who is life, descends into death, the very one who surrendered all glory and power and authority, then ascends far above all the heavens. Well, why does he ascend to the heavens? To be in charge? To be worshipped? To receive the power to visit retribution upon his enemies? Well, let's turn to Ephesians 4.9. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens. Why? So that he might fill all things. He descends into the deepest depths and then ascends high above the heavens so that he might fill all things. So, what does all mean in this verse? Well, everything. Everything between God at the above the heavens, to the grave, Sheol, hell, Hades, below the earth, below life. From the one who is is life far above the heavens and the angels, to death itself, and everything in between. That is what all things means. The mission of God, who is over all, through all, and in all, is to unite all things in Christ, that he might fill all things. This is the icon of the resurrection from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Christ is risen from the dead. He exits the tomb. He is gripping Adam and Eve by the wrist, rising them with him, raising them with him. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He has despoiled hell. He has despoiled the grave taking the captive, captive, captives, captive, and leading them to freedom, to life. The father chooses for his dead captive children, choosing them until their wills are released from captivity to the lies of the evil one, free from the captivity to fear and death, healed and finally free to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. The dead faith. Their dead faith is replaced by the living faith and faithfulness of Christ. They are free to give God what God is owed, in open heart, ready to be filled with all the fullness of God. In him we have redemption through, I'm going to read uh, from Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, earlier in the letter of when this will be. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Well, there's the Father looking just like Jesus in the Gospels, lavishing upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he set forth in him regarding his plan of the fullness of times to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. God's plan, the fullness of time, is to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven, things on earth. God, who is Father of all, is over all, through all, and in all, is to unite all things in Christ, that he might fill all things. This is not the end times, but there will come a time to the end of this present evil age and the fullness of the age to come, where heaven and earth are made one, to know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Not just to know facts about him that you read in a book, however holy and sacred and trustworthy that book is, but to know him person to person, heart to heart, soul to soul, spirit to spirit. To be blessed because the Father has revealed to Jesus to you. To be blessed because Jesus has revealed the Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
is happening right now in you. This is the answer to Jesus' prayer of John 17, 21. I, Father, I pray that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us. And Jesus prayed other things too, like on the cross while being crucified. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is the same heart as the Jesus who was coming back. This is the same heart that the Father has. Forgive them. They don't know what they do. This is Jesus revealing the heart of the Father of all, his incarnation, perfect life of obedience, his faithful obedience unto death and descent into the grave, to rescue the captives, and his ascension far above the heavens, uniting all things in heaven and on earth so that God might fill all things, not in part, not just a spark of the divine within us, but with the fullness of Christ's union with the Father, that spark becomes the full unveiling, consuming fire of God's love. The mission of God who is over all, through all, and in all is to unite all things in Christ that he might fill all things. When we look upon all that the living word, the sword of the spirit coming out of Jesus' mouth, cutting away, pruning off all that is not God, turning hearts of stone, and if necessary, smashing hearts of stone so that he can re-wet them and turn them into hearts of flesh. Not to destroy them, but to rebuild them, to give them new life. All the lies, all the fears, all the addictions, all the hell we are unleashing into the world, all the pride with which we pursue religion, all the power we use to control others, all the forgiveness and hate which we justified in the name of some warped image of God, all these ungodly, unworshipping parts, the anti-life, the anti-Christ, those spiritual viruses hiding in the depths, they will all be healed. They will be cut from us, cut from the body of Christ who became sin for us, cut, thrown away, and burned, never to infect us and take us captive again. All that soul cancer, that just was taken up all the room in our hearts that God wanted to fill with the flow of divine love, will be gone, removed from us, judged, destroyed, forever, never to return. That is the good judgment of God. To save, to heal, to fill. Evil, the absence of good, will have no place to exist, for God will be all in all. The wrath of God will truly consume all evil hiding in the hearts of his children as the love of God fills their hearts with the consuming fire of the beloved. In the fullness of time, the mission of God is to unite all things in Christ, that he might fill all things. This will be our new normal in the ages of ages, in the fullness of time in the kingdom of God. This is his message, message his mission to you. So come to the table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. There is no darkness hiding behind the face of Christ. The Lord who returns is the same Lord who left. And all power and authority is not giving to execute retributive justice, but a restorative justice that sets all things right that removes all the blockages from your heart, mind, soul, and body so that God can feel you and be all in all. This is why Jesus went to the cross. This is why on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, he blessed it, and he broke it. This is my body broken for you. Eat you all of it so that I can heal you Enter into your brokenness and heal it from the inside out and fill it with my presence. He took the cup. This is the wine of the new covenant of my blood for the remission of sins. I'm not holding your past against you. In your ignorance, I forgive you for the harm you have done me to the dishonor you have given to God for the damage upon your own soul and that of others. 
I freely forgive. But I'm not going to stop with just forgiving you of your past. I'm going to remake you, fashion you, give you a heart of flesh for a heart of stone. I'm going to enter into you and let my worship, my faithfulness, my wisdom, my holiness take root in you and transform you and unite you to myself, to unite you with all with whom I am united with, this communion of saints. Come and taste that the Lord is good. God over us, God in us, God through us, redeeming all things so that you might fill all things with your love, with your glory. That we would be vessels of love to the glory of your name, now and forever. Amen.